Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, 
may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to the heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elisha said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethlehem, Bethel, came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take you master, your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know, be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went, out, went on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am taking before you, as I am being taken before, from you, it will be granted for you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah descended into the whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and around him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above, to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before my, me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of his cause, for God himself is judge. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians. If our, gospel, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God, the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness. 
who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, Lord, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, you, Lord Christ. Christ. Well, I don't know what will happen now. 
We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would love to have a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. These words, which some of you might recognize, were delivered by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. the night before he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee. His famous declaration, I've been to the mountaintop, is, of course, a reference to the Bible. He's referring directly to the scene at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, where God permits Moses to see the entire promised land from the summit of a mountain before he dies. But King could also be referring obliquely to today's scene. A select few of Jesus' disciples are given the privilege of ascending a mountain with him and seeing him in a form that made his divine nature more plainly obvious to any observer. I believe that Martin was saying that he had experienced something similar to that in his life. God had given him a vision of reality that transcends what most of us normally see. He had seen things as they really are, as God has really created them, and he very much liked what he saw. For him, America, and the world as a whole is a great divine dream, a dream that has yet to be realized for sure, but nonetheless a beautiful dream. But let's not fall into the trap of oversimplifying Dr. King and what he said. First, let's have a look at another famous and controversial figure of the 1950s and 60s, Malik El Shabazz, known for most of his adult life as Malcolm X. Malcolm would, for nearly all of his public life, never have uttered anything like the lines I just quoted from Martin. For him, America is not a dream, but a nightmare. Things like slavery, misogyny, and racial injustice are not exceptions to what America is, but rather expressions of America's core nature. It is the acts of goodness mercy, and justice that are the exceptions. Now the trouble with these two great figures is that they have been frozen in time in our memory. The oversimplified views of what they believed and stood for that I just offered represent where they may have each been a few years before their lives ended but they did not stay there. Martin's last few years of life were marked by the ramping up of the war in Vietnam and an explosion of the urban poverty and crime that are now so common in America's big industrial cities, especially those in the North. Martin's view of America as an unrealized dream was really challenged by these new realities. He began to see in his beloved land more sinister forces at work 
ones that he had a hard time fitting into his narrative of, I have a dream. Yet even in this more shadowy landscape, he never entirely lost the beatific vision of his earlier years. And Malcolm also experienced a transformation, but one that went largely in the opposite direction. He had a falling out with the nation of Islam and its leader, the Elijah Muhammad, and he made an independent pilgrimage to Mecca, which is considered to be the geographic spiritual hub of Islam. Upon his return, he began to establish his own movement in the United States, one that had a markedly different tone from the nation of Islam. America wasn't simply a nightmarish place ruled by devils. It was a land of unripe hope and potential unity, hope that could ultimately be realized through discipline and focused action. Now contained within all of this recent history is a timeless question. At its root, it is really a theological question. Is this a dream or is it a nightmare? What is the true nature of humanity and for that matter, all of creation? Are we creatures that are good, beautiful, and divine by nature, but who sometimes stumble off the path? Or are we, as John Calvin so infamously said, totally depraved and incapable of doing any good on our own? Now, I wish I could say that the Bible is 100% clear on this question, but it isn't. It invites us into a lively debate on the topic, but if we're looking for evidence of either side, we can find it. Today's gospel, however, seems to lean a little bit more toward a verdict of dream. In it, we see God in the flesh, leading his disciples up the mountain and shedding the veil so that they get to see things as they truly are. And the vision that they see is, while perhaps terrifying, astounding and beautiful beyond all measure. And all of this could not possibly be more relevant to the upcoming season of Lent. Lent is, of course, a season of repentance, Many of us have been taught that, perhaps even had it thrust upon us since we were children. But what does it mean? Does it mean that we're awful creatures who need to beat ourselves up for 40 days every year as punishment? I don't think so. I suggest we can get a whole lot more of what God desires us to get out of Lent when we adopt the dream view of our condition rather than the nightmare. Now this is something we need to choose and choose deliberately. It's not something that we can prove. It really comes down to asking ourselves which universe would we rather live in, dream or nightmare? If our answer is dream, then the work of Lent is this, recovering and reclaiming a nature that is already in there and has perhaps just gotten temporarily tarnished by the changes and chances of life. This is the holy Lent to which I will be inviting us this upcoming Wednesday. So will you join me in this kind of Lent? Here's how it goes. Look in the mirror. Make the conscious decision that what you see there is a creature 
who is strong, beautiful, wise, compassionate, healthy, and just. Where you see evidence to the contrary, and there is beyond all doubt such evidence in all of us, think of it as dust clinging to something that is otherwise an object of incredible beauty. What will it take to dislodge that dust? Are there things you need to take out of your life? Are there things you need to add in? These are your individual Lenten disciplines. And when you've done that, have a look outside. Look at our church. Look at our community. Look at our nation. Look at the whole world. Make the conscious decision that what you see there is a creation that is robust, healthy, and fundamentally benign to everyone and everything that inhabits it. Again, where you see evidence to the contrary, and you will, choose to see it as the tarnish, but not the real object. Ask yourself the questions of what actions will help polish off the tarnish and allow the real thing to shine in all of its glory. These are our collective Lenten disciplines. Now I realize that this may sound way too simplistic and I could easily be accused of going too easy on us. This past year has shown us that our need for repentance is great. I'm not going to sugarcoat the degree to which events, to which events suggest that much has gone off track, both within and around us. But if taking the approach of viewing ourselves and our world as a nightmare were effective in making positive change, wouldn't we already be living in a better world? I think that one has already been tried many times too often. I suggest that consciously adopting the point of view that we and all creatures are by nature beautiful and perfect reflections of the God who made us and compromised only by our condition actually puts us on stronger footing, not weaker. We are more motivated and more empowered to make positive change if we, than if we are constantly seeing evil in ourselves and in others. And so it is in this stronger position that I invite us to spend our Lent. We have hard work to do. The shadows right now are deep. But just as the thinking of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King began to synergize toward the end of their lives, our vision can also coalesce into something that embraces both realism and hope. With that vision firmly intact, I wish you, three days early, a happy and holy Lent. And let us now together reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, 
He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With boundless joy in Christ's epiphany to all peoples, let us pray, saying, O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O God, who made your blessed Son manifest to all the peoples of the world, and bid him to preach peace to those far off and those near, you call your people to unite in worship, that we might receive power to become your children, divine beings, in whom your word has hands and feet. Pour out your blessing upon the church throughout the world that gathers for this purpose. Send this blessing especially today upon the Anglican Communion, including Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, the Anglican Church of Canada, I'm sorry, and the Anglican Church of Canada. Pour out your spirit also upon the Episcopal Church and our diocese, including Michael, our presiding bishop, Mark, our bishop, the Church of our Savior in Oakland, and the Church of our Savior in Mill Valley. Let your blessing also come to our fellow faith assemblies, especially the Shiva Vishnu Temple in Livermore. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O God, in whom mercy and justice embrace, we ask for your love to take wings in all the nations and peoples of the world. Bend the hearts of all nations and peoples toward peace and righteousness. Send your spirit especially on Joe, our president, Gavin, our governor, Bob, our mayor, and all who serve in legislative assemblies or judicial roles in this and every land. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O God of perfect health and wholeness, in this time of pandemic and the fear and uncertainty that surround it, we lift up to you those who care for the sick and the suffering. Pour out a special blessing upon all who follow your call to care for others in body, mind, or spirit, especially all nurses, doctors, police, firefighters, educators, and Brad O and Brad S. Give them the gifts of courage and joy in their work and protect them from all adversity and harm. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. O Word made flesh, this congregation gathers together as a people, inspired by your first coming and looking for your coming again. Bless all its members with the gifts of hope, wisdom, and compassion. We lift up to you especially these members in our weekly cycle of prayer. We pray for Jessica, Jessica and Nesta, for Carol, Casey, Corinne, Connor, Kara and Carolyn. And we also commend to your grace and protection these in military service, Aaron, 
Joey, Abigail, Valerie, Amber, Christopher, and Taylor. O oh Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. We pray also for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those who have requested our prayers for healing and wholeness. We pray for Olivia, Becky, Brett M, Carl, Carol, Kathy, Chilope M, Dave R, David, Aaron, Esteban, Miroslava, Tamara, Glennis, Geraldine, Umberto, Candida and family, Janice, Jim and Janet, Josh, Lisa B, Luke, Marge and family, Marie R, Mary L, Mary M, Marissa and family, Monty and Judy, Nick, Michael, Sandra and Henrietta, Sarah, Michael E, Sylvia P, Steve W and children, Tamara S, the Herman family, the Purcell family, the Moon family, the Ruzika family, the Bohr family, and the Montgomery family. Give to your people the gifts of comfort and healing, as well as a lively and abiding faith in your goodness throughout all circumstances. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. Lord Christ, in your passion and resurrection, you made death the gateway to new and eternal life. Pour out that life upon all your servants departed this life, especially Sharon H., Linda G., John M., Marie R., Vern P., Joan B., and Elda M., and raise them to everlasting glory in your kingdom. O Christ of all nations, hear our prayer. And now, O Christ, in eager anticipation of your coming kingdom, we pray to you with hearts and voices for our other needs and concerns, and we offer you thanks for all the blessings of this life. O oh God, just as your Son granted to his chosen disciples a vision upon the holy mountain, grant to us who lift our prayers up to you a vision of you, a vision of your creation as it truly is, and then empower us, give us wisdom and courage to act in such a way as to help bring that vision to its full fruition. This we ask through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And a very happy last Sunday after the Epiphany, the final Sunday before the season of Lent to all of you. I certainly invite you as you are able in these disorienting times to see these next three days as a time of celebration and a time for both solemn and joyful preparation for the upcoming season of Lent, uh, a season of restoration and renewal that the church has observed for nearly all the centuries of its existence. If you are new to us, if you are joining this worship and uh, you have not in the past regularly been a part of St. Bartholomew's, I wish you the warmest of welcomes and I'm so glad you're with us. My name is Andy, I'm the priest and pastor here at St. Bart's and I would love to hear from you and love to get to know you. Uh, contact information such as phone number and email addresses are all available on the same website where you were able to find this service and I really encourage you to reach out. We're about to move into the service of Holy Communion, um, not only communion host for the small worship team that's gathered here, but enough for the entire congregation is going to be consecrated. Uh, those who come to the parking lot service either later today or throughout the season of Lent will have this available. And it is also my intent to uh, make a direct visit and make direct contact with each member, family, and individual of St. Bartholomew's throughout this season of Lent. So one way or another, communion and simply fellowship and visit time, uh, it is my intent to make sure that that's made available to everybody throughout Lent. Uh, the final thing is uh, please know that I will be in the office for much of Shrove Tuesday uh, and Ash Wednesday. Those of you who wish to receive ashes, wish to uh, participate in the Sacrament of Reconciliation, or simply have some pastoral fellowship are most welcome to come at that time. Please do check via email or phone just to make sure that the exact hour you wish to come is an available time, but just know that that is going to be available as we transition from this Epiphany season into Lent. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory, in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. For the goodness and love which you've made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember, we remember his, his death, death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament 
of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where, with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Bartholomew, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore let, let us keep, keep the feast. feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in spirit or in the flesh in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. In thanksgiving, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. 
Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Hallelujah!